Good morning and welcome to Bridgeway Baptist Church here this morning. We are meeting in a pop-up location in a field. <laughs> we have a good background behind us, but uh, cattle are lowing in the next field, sheep are buying in this field, and God's little children are right here. And we're just glad for those that are here this morning and for those that are tuning in. And we ask you to look in your Bibles this morning, if you would please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, throughout God's word, one of the things that a lot of people miss, if you only study doctrine, all right, doctrine is great, it's basic, it's foundational, but if you miss the precepts and you miss the principles of God that are given therein, then you've missed so much that God wanted you to have. And so before we go any further, could I invite you to join me in a word of prayer, Lord Thank you for the news this morning of a new one being added, Lord, to uh, one of our families this morning. And Father, we thank you for the general rain that's beginning. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of those that are joined in spite of the weather. And Lord, we ask that you would meet in the midst of us today. And Father, that your presence would be felt for your word and the preaching today, God. And that we would allow you, welcome you, embrace you to change our hearts and cause us to be more like you every day and bring glory to your name in so doing. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. First Corinthians, just stay there for a minute. Several weeks ago, we started this new series on how to make your lives make a difference. Now, that's the very goal of us as Christians is to make our lives make a difference in this world. This world needs people that would make a difference. Now, you can think of financiers. You can think of maybe bankers. You can think of maybe businessmen. You can think of politicians, great people that you could quote down through history. But there is no greater difference than, that you could make on the face of this earth than to reflect Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God or to lead someone to the Lord. Can I get an amen on that? That is the greatest difference. So a lot of times we measure ourselves in light of the people of the world. But there's no need to do that. We're not going to live for eternity here on earth. We're going to live for eternity in heaven. And that's our goal is to make a difference here. And so it would matter in eternity. All right. And so we started with the word commitment. There is a void today in our churches of talking about commitment because we're afraid if we talk about commitment, we'll lose people. Can I just say that if your pastor unintentionally has ever made you angry because he preached on something that stepped on your toes, please look past him and see the Lord. If we love God's word, God's word is going to step on our toes. Amen. I mean, it's got to. It's got to for us to grow. And can I tell you that even though that we're in this, whatever it is going on in the world right now, be faithful with your giving. Be faithful with your attendance. Be faithful with your work in doing the church work that God's called us to do. Call each other. I've told you before. Give someone on the phone this week, make a habit out of it, you know, and encourage people. People go, well, you know, I've never had anyone complain about this, but when's the pastor going to put up something on Bridgeway? And you know what I've discovered? I'm finding some of our men are putting things up on Bridgeway, and I step back. You know why? I want that to happen. That's why we created those forums. And because of that, you may not know that I may be busy. I may be encouraging people who may need encouragement worse. Every week, uh, you know, if, if we think about ourselves every week, trust me, I'm talking to people that when I talk to them, I feel insignificant in issues that I'm dealing with. And if we'll, we'll do that during the week, find people, maybe they're missing or something like that, and encourage them and just be committed in that, God will bless that, all right? And as we do that, we're going to grow. And the other thing that's not talked enough about is integrity. How did it come that in God's house we don't talk enough about integrity? Integrity matters. And we spent 
three weeks divesting or digesting each point of that so that it would be remembered. And that is the integrity in everything that we do. Everything that we say. And why integrity matters so much, that first point, because it pleases God, it affects others, and it blesses me. Now, I want all three of those things, right? It affects, it pleases God, it affects others, it blesses me. And we use this verse, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, because, guys, we need to remember this. These are principles that absolutely changed my life. Here's one of them. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Did you get the implication there? Did you hear that? What wasn't said straight out, but implied there, God shows himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. And we, we told you what that perfect means. It doesn't mean I'm a perfect person. You're a perfect person. It means our heart is perfectly focused on pleasing God. You say, well, I don't see God active in my life. Well, two answers to that. One, he may be and you not know it. And the other one is, are you committed? <laughs> right? Right? Remember, this is real important. Look at me. You're not viewed as a crowd before God. You're viewed as an individual. That's why churches and Christians should never say, well, this can't be that bad. So many Christians are doing it. Right? Because you're not viewed as a crowd and not rewarded as a crowd. You're rewarded and examined as individuals. That's integrity, all right? And then we talked about how to live with integrity last week. I, that's the kind of thing that God wants me to do. He wants us to live this particular way. In Ephesians 4, 15, he said, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head. I need to determine to do that. So I need to determine to always speak the truth, stand for what's right, and stay clean. Did you hear that last one? Stay clean. Our hearts need to stay clean. And then how to maintain your integrity. I told you last week I'd be talking about that today because once we get that up on board, it's not enough to do that for a day, a week, or a month. We've got to maintain our integrity, and there's three ways to do that. First of all, this morning, choose the right kind of friends. Now, it's one thing when I witness to people or I befriend people out in the world, the unsaved, that's one thing. It's another thing if those are our best buds. Now you stick with me. You may disagree, but you stick with me. I'm going to demonstrate it to you this morning, all right? And you say, well, I don't know, preacher, this, that. It doesn't matter. All that matters to a Christian who wants to grow, wants to please God, is what God's Word says. Amen? And so choose the right kind of friends. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, be not deceived. And you need to underline that. Evil communications, that means fellowship, corrupt good manners. Man, that's powerful. Evil communications, in other words, evil fellowship, the Bible tells us, corrupts good manners. Now remember, this is about the year 59 AD, when this is written, uh, Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth. I just want to give you a couple of perspectives on what he's saying there. J. Vernon McGee, if you've never listened to J. Vernon McGee or read, he, he's the one that did five years through the Bible, and every five years he would do that again. He's long gone now. He's with the Lord. But he said this, the Corinthian believers were being deceived by those who questioned the resurrection. A lot of those were Sadducees. And that fits, right? They don't believe in the resurrection, so they're sad, you see, okay? So the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, didn't believe in a lot of different things, and they were listening to a lot of people who had plenty to say, but no knowledge of God. Paul's saying 
that if they listen to the wrong information, they're going to act wrong, they're going to behave wrong, and he tells them to stop sinning by listening to them because there is going to be a resurrection, and so that means there's going to be an accounting of God's people to God. Is that heavy? When you come to church, don't you want to know the truth? You know, it, it may be abrasive, but God said the truth would set you free. <laughs> I want to be free of the Dalton Walker that I used to be. I want to be free to serve God. H.M. Morris said this about evil communications. It was a warning that wrong friends lead to wicked behavior. And God's word teaches that there's going to be an accounting to God. When we forget that, hey, identify with the generation we're living in now when I say this. He said this nearly 100 years ago. When we forget that, it leads to the philosophy of fatalistic, self-willed living. His last sentence there, we will give an account to God one day. We're living in that generation right now. Where that we just live for the hour, live for the day, live for this lifetime. Look at me, please. We should be living for eternity. I like that old hymn. It's a hymn, and I love it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. How many of you know that hymn? Beautiful hymn. And uh, we can look at it as old, but it was truthful, all right? And so he lays this biblical principle for us to adopt, to adopt, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. In other words, wicked fellowship. He lays this, this biblical principle, and you. so here's what it means. You really are like who you run around with. Now, guys, all you got to do is look right here, and I can tell you, that I am like what I eat, okay? No denying it. I have a body of evidence to substantiate it, all right? And so you really are uh, like who you run around with. And if I, if I stand on a platform somewhere and someone grabs my hand, it's far easier for them to pull me down than it is for me to pull them up. It's called the law of gravity. And it's easier for the world to pull us down than it is for us to pull them up. Even the Lord, when he sent out his disciples to witness and to, to minister, he sent them out two by two. Are you with me? Because we're stronger together. That's why we meet in the rain, in a field, whatever we have to do, because God knew what he was doing when he set all this up. And we need to meet. We need to see each other. We need to talk to each other. And you're... Value yours and other people's integrity more than your image. You know, this is, this is a real easy thing for preachers to get caught up on their image. Like to drive the right cars, live in the right home. It's called the success syndrome. And a long time ago, my wife and I adopted the concept that we were just going to be successful with the Lord. Right? So in the world's mind, and even maybe in other Christians, we're not a success. But I'm not shooting for the success of this world. I'm shooting for the success of eternity and pleasing my Father in heaven. Proverbs 28 and verse 6 is our foundation. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways though he be rich. Nothing wrong with riches. God bless those that the Lord has trusted that way. Uh, and please never be biased to people because they have money. You know, what a, what a trap we fall into. But, but also, guys, let's remember that we're all equally important in God's eyes. Okay? So you're not less important because that you may not have money. Don't get your value system by the world telling you what you should value. Few things will destroy your life faster than greed. Very few things. And uh, we want to appear to be what we're really not. And when we do that, we put up pretenses. Okay? 
Toffler once said this, our greatest pretenses are built up not to hide our evil, but to hide our emptiness. That's the truth, amen. It's not, it's not that we're some evil international terrorist. Many times the reason people wear a mask is to hide the emptiness that they have, to hide their insecurities, to hide the things God wants to fill in your life in the first place. And I, I walk around, there's an old song, you know, I forget the exact words to it, but, you know, it's a person walking down the street and they're looking people in the eye and all they see is emptiness in their heart, in their eyes. Guys, if you're a Christian, be full of the things of the Lord. Know the joy of the Lord. And I guarantee it'll fill up every crack, every crevice in your life. The things that you fear the most, you will feel the most of God in. Okay? Everyone has to decide what's more important to me, truth or things. In other words, let me put it this way, truth or illusion, what's more important? And if you decide truth's more important, there's going to have to be some things that you give up in order to tell the truth. You know, when we get married... We don't really know each other, do we? <laughs> I'm not saying it's not natural. It takes time to reveal things that have been hidden all their life. But what happens to the relationship as we do that? As time goes by and things are revealed, we grow to love each other more and more. That's what God wants in our lives, not only with him, but with others. And if things become more important than truth, you'll have to make a profit. Uh, you, I mean, you'll lie to make a profit. You'll cheat on your income taxes. You'll misuse company resources. You'll do things that are dastardly lacking of integrity. And when things are more important than truth to you, you've made a titanic mistake in your life. Your ship is going to sink. Remember, people of integrity don't wear masks. Watch your integrity more than your image. And finally this morning, watch what you watch. Poison. What a lot of the world is showing today, evil is not even hiding anymore. And we have come to accept it bit by bit. And it doesn't glorify God a bit. Watch what you watch in your life. In other words, filter what you're allowing in your mind and heart. Would you listen to this verse in Psalm 101? Verse 2 through 4, the Bible says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I talk to men about this all the time. I say, you want to help in this area, in areas where we struggle with, and ladies, this applies to you. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Paste that on your computer. Put that over your TV. Abhor that which is evil. Okay? I hate the work of them that turn aside. It goes on. It shall not cleave to me because a froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. That's what God needs to see in our hearts. When his eyes are going to and fro and looking on the face of the earth. And he's looking, not in crowds, he's looking in your heart and my heart individually. He needs to see hearts that go, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I will not know a wicked person. I will abhor that which is evil. Hey, you know what we're talking about here? We're talking about what Christianity is still supposed to be. Christianity is like a lot of salt today that's been stored for a long time and hadn't been used. It's lost its savor. It's lost its potency. In 
If you want that potency back, you've got to rediscover that integrity with God. Integrity with God comes first. Second Chronicles 16, 9. Again, I want to repeat it. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore thou Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. And there's just some things we don't need to watch, guys. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. You say, oh, I've heard that verse a lot of times. And so it doesn't mean anything to you now? Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are or of good report, if there be any virtue, there be any praise, think on these things. All the time I see Christians, I talk to Christians who in all appearances want to identify more with looking like the world and behaving like them and fitting in with them than they do with Christianity. Something's wrong with that picture. These things ought not so to be, the Lord said. We can't rationalize trash and foolishness. Foolishness. Proverbs 15, 14, The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Can I just take a side note for a minute? You know, this week I was just putting some verses together in Scripture that all of us know, working on principles in my life. You know how the Bible tells us, Old Testament, you know, if my people, which are called by my name, the emphasis being on my people, right? My people, not the whole world. You know, those that went through the narrow gate, you know, the minority, the few, there be that enter therein. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves the Bible said, fall on their faces. They would seek his repentance. What was the promise of God? That he would heal the land. Jump forward in time with me real quick to the rapture. The rapture, the, the Holy Spirit and the church are taken out, right? And the world just goes <laughs> right then. Come on, amen? Dots connecting. So how important does that make your prayer life? To know that God promised in the beginning that if our prayer life and heart was right with him, that God would heal the land. And then when we see the Holy Spirit and the church taken out, we see the world falls flat into evil and we're uh, seen as part of the restraining efforts of God and so why is it important that we pray? Could you not watch and pray for an hour? God wants us to pray. To be instant, in season, out of season. To pray about everything. Can I say this? The more things you pray about, the more things you'll want to pray about. The less things you pray about, the less things you're going to pray about. And so it's a habit that we set in style in our life. And you say, but people think I'm foolish. Who cares? The righteousness of God on the face of the earth is embodied many times in the prayers of God's people. When we quit, we get holes in our boat. Say, well, it's just a hole. A hole in a boat's a hole in a boat. <laughs> Amen. Whether it's a gash, a tear, or a hole, a hole in a boat is a hole. And that's what the lack of integrity is in our life. It's a hole in the hull. Guys, we need to have integrity in everything that we say and do. The bottom line is if you want to be a person of integrity, you've got to take care of the small things in your life 
things in your private life that nobody sees. You got to care about the details that are important, care about the things that seem inconsequential if you're going to have integrity. And integrity, I want to repeat it again, is what you are when no one's looking, because God is. That's who you really are. It's not that best foot that we put forward or any of those things. So my challenge for you today is to commit to becoming a person of integrity. Remember we started with committing to become, to commit to become a person of integrity, even if it costs you something. If it costs you a job, it costs you an opportunity, it costs you something in life, be the kind of person who practices integrity because the world is not our audience. God is our audience, right? For 2 Peter 1, 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. That's who God wants you to be in representing heaven. A virtuous Christian who's connected to God. This next week, I'm going to talk about how to restore your passion in life. It's a slow build to a revival. <laughs> you know, I know that people are aware of this. I know we see it, but we don't think about it very long. How come is it when it comes to sports, we jump up and down, get excited, yell, can't contain ourselves? Man, when, when uh, you know, our team gets a try. When they score a point. How come is it we jump up and down, yeah, go! How come is it we don't have that in Christianity? No, 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 don't dismiss that. That's a valid point. Where is the passion? Oh, I love God. Where is the passion? Would you have got married to your wife with that same kind of passion? I love God. I love Paula. Yeah. No, I love her. She's great. She's wonderful. She's awesome. <laughs> I'm telling you, it wouldn't have sold my wife. <laughs> and it wouldn't have sold me. I'm just asking you to think about it in relationship to the message, how to have impact, how to make a difference in our, our world around us. Guys, don't be like the world. Be like God intended us to be. Let him change you in the ways he wants to change you and seek to please God in everything that we do. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your people. And Lord, their passion in being out today, despite the rain, umbrellas everywhere, wow. Meeting in a pasture, wow. God, help us to be people of commitment and integrity and help us to cheer each other on. Lord, thank you that you cheer us on from your word, with your spirit. God, help us to be the kind of people that reflect on your glory and your virtue in everything that we say and we do. Help us to get a hold of the principles of God in our life. And Lord, help us this week as we think about the passion in our life for Christ on a daily basis and prepare for this next week's message. In Jesus' name we ask it. The people said.